So now we go to the next speaker, Marcel. Can you share screen? I'm on my way. Yeah. So can you see this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's by uh, Marcel Schaub from LMU uh, Germany. Uh, he will talk about the BCS functional and a weak homogeneous magnetic field, its critical temperature and microscopic derivation of Jensberg Landau theory. Okay, thank you, Ayman, and thank you, Michele and uh, Wafa, for having me. Um, so, this is my PhD project, and this is about the BCS functional of superconductivity. And uh, I'm going to investigate two things, namely the critical temperature shift, which is caused by a weak constant magnetic field. And uh, I'm going to show you that it's free energy uh, is given by Ginzburg-Landau theory in the weak magnetic field limit. I should say that this is joint work with Andreas Deuchert and uh, Christian Heinzel, my advisor, and the paper is about to be uploaded hopefully in March. Okay, I have in mind a sample of fermions, which could, for example, be electrons in a metal, where the green balls are the electrons and the red balls are the ions. And the sample is exposed to a constant magnetic field, which is pointing in the E3 direction and strength B, which is just a number um, that is positive. Okay, and I'm choosing the gauge uh, one half times the cross product um, of B and X. And I'm thinking of the sample of being periodically extended um, to all of R3. And uh, I, have a, I have to be a bit careful due to the magnetic field, but I can do this using magnetic translations. And uh, in this way, the system is then periodic with respect to the lattice that is spanned by these three basis vectors, which are stretched standard basis vectors of the usual three-dimensional space, okay? And my, my unit cell is denoted by QB, it's the Q. And in this way, I'm modeling a system with a constant non-zero magnetic flux, um, which is the main novelty in this business. So in compared to preceding works on the BCS functional. Okay. Now I'm describing this with BCS theory and this amounts to assuming that I have an attractive interaction between the particles, which you can think of as a, a negative function minus V, which is radial and uh, so decaying sufficiently fast. And um, this causes the particles to undergo a Cooper pair formation, which is indicated by these clouds here. Um, and this, this process is taking place below a certain critical temperature that I'm going to show you in a minute or introduce to you in a minute. And uh, I'm now interested in the weak magnetic field limit, so to say. So I'm assuming that this, uh, this magnetic field strength, it's much less than one. In this way, the system becomes macroscopically large as opposed to the microscopic interaction between the particles. Okay, so this is going to model a separation of scales that I'm comment on, uh, commenting on later. So mathematically, BCS theory is a effective two particle microscopic theory in which its states are described by such a one particle density matrix here. Um, it has components gamma and alpha and where gamma is a self-adjoint operator ranging between zero and one. Its local try, so to speak, is modeling the density of the system. And uh, I'm not fixing this density in the talk, so to speak. So I am um, in a grand canonical set. Alpha, in turn, is a Hilbert-Schmidt operator locally, um, and its kernel is interpreted as the Cooper pair wave function. 
And I, now I'm excluding spin from my system. <coughs> system. So this kernel is symmetric with respect to exchange of its coordinates. And then you have this quasi freeness condition which relates gamma and alpha. And you know this from second quantization if you come from this field, but I'm not talking about second quantization here. So now I can introduce to you the BCS functional which consists of three terms, namely the kinetic term, the entropic term, and the interaction term. And uh, the kinetic term is first given by the magnetic Laplacian with the magnetic potential from before minus a chemical potential acting on gamma and I'm taking the trace per unit volume of this object. Um, then I have the entropic part which is conveniently given by trace gamma log gamma as usual because my states are described by these matrices. And then I have the interaction part and you see the minus here it's referring to the attractive interaction and you can interpret this as the Hilbert Schmidt scalar product of alpha times V alpha with V acting as a two particle operator here, okay? Um, now, if I neglect the interaction for a moment, then you can show with fairly moderate effort that it is energetically favorable for this functional to be in a diagonal state, meaning that alpha is equal to zero and the gamma is equal to the usual Fermi-Dirac distribution of the magnetic Laplacian. Um, if I turn on the interaction, then there's a non-trivial competition going on between this and the interaction part. So it might indeed be that this normal state here uh, becomes instable for certain temperatures. Which leads me to the definition of the critical temperature um, and this is given in terms of the translation invariant, so to speak, um, BCS functional, namely the magnetic field put to zero in the magnetic Laplacian. And then it is a, um, an old work by now from 2008 that shows that it suffices to look for small perturbations around the normal state in direction alpha. So what I'm considering here to, to see instability is I'm considering small perturbations, uh, small, the, the, the Hessian matrix of the BCS functional at the normal state in direction alpha. And this is given by this linear operator KT minus V, where KT represents the kinetic and entropic part of the functional. And it has this peculiar dispersion relation P squared minus mu over the tangent. Okay. Um, now, since I want to see instability, I need to see whether this Hessian matrix is positive definite or not. So I'm looking um, for the spectrum of this operator and I want to see, I want to identify temperature regimes where this operator has purely positive spectrum or if there might be a negative eigenvalue. And since this operator KT is monotone in T, there is indeed a unique, a unique temperature, which I call TC, that separates these regimes. And this is my critical temperature. Okay, I'm now assuming that this temperature is indeed positive um, and that this lowest eigenvalue is simple. Okay, so, and I denote the ground state eigenfunction by alpha star of the KTC minus V operator. And now I have to introduce to you the Ginzburg-Landau functional, which is my limiting model of superconductivity. So it's a macroscopic model. It is given in terms of a single uh, order parameter psi and is given in terms of three integral terms with three positive coefficients, lambda zero, lambda two, and lambda three, which are labeled like that just because of consistency with existing works. Now it has a kinetic term, a quadratic term, and a quartic term. And now you should think of this uh, magnetic potential here as being two times the original one evaluated at B equals one. And this reflects the fact that the Cooper pair wave, uh, the Cooper pair 
um, takes twice the charge of a single particle. And now in view of BCS theory, we will see that psi squared models the density of Cooper pairs. And of course I can look at the ground state energy of this system, which I denote by EGLD. Um, I realize that this model has a phase transition at some critical parameter DC in terms of the Landau Hamiltonian. Okay, and in this special situation, the ground state of energy of the Landau Hamiltonian is just two. So this is, this is why I've written the two here. And I see that I have a non-trivial minimizer for the Ginzburg-Landau functional for values of D that are bigger than this DC. And otherwise it's just trivially minimized by zero. Okay, so this is my limiting model and then I can show you my main result or the first one F2. So I look at the BCS energy of the system, which is the infimum over all states of the BCS functional compared to the energy of the normal state. And then I see that if I'm in a linear scaling of the temperature around the critical temperature, then this energy is given to leading order by the Ginzburg-Landau energy. And moreover, I have a decomposition result, which is uh, saying that this Cooper pair wave function decomposes into a product where the microscopic part of the theory is encoded in the relative coordinate. Uh, it's given by the uh, translation invariant BCS theory, i.e. the ground state energy function alpha star. So this is kind of the, the microscopic part you see here. And then I have the macroscopic part, which is the uh, wave function psi and determined in terms of the center of mass coordinate. And this is macroscopically extended uh, and living on the length scale square root of V inverse. And Psi, if gamma was a minimizer, then Psi is a minimizer of the Ginzburg-Landau function. So this result was obtained um, earlier in 2012 and 14 in the context of a bounded periodic magnetic potential. And um, I should say that the main difficulty compared to that work is really to obtain the decomposition result in the context of a constant magnetic field. So this is the main difficulty here. Now my second result pertains to the critical temperature shift. And unfortunately, I can look at the Hessian matrix again and I find that it's not monotone in T anymore. So what I really have to look at is two critical temperatures, namely the first one, which is defined as the lowest critical, uh, the lowest temperature above which the normal state is always stable. And the lower critical temperature, which is the largest temperature such that below it, the normal state is always instable. And then I can see that, um, this, these two temperatures for small enough E are confined in a small cone around a linear behavior whose slope is given precisely by the critical parameter of the Ginzburg-Landau function. Um, I should say that this was investigated in a linearized setting of BCS theory in 2019 by Frank Heinzel and Langmann and what we do now, or how you can interpret this, this result here, is that we justify this linearization there, and we confirm that the um, same critical temperature shift applies to the full BCS function. So this is all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. Uh, so probably there is a question by Jakob. He raised hand yeah. during uh, the talk. <laughs> Well, it's just a minor point, but uh, you, you say small b, so uh, so in which units, so to say? Uh, uh, in some sense, in, in, in units of, um, if you want the interaction potential range, yeah? this, is, this is assumed to be of order one. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and B is just I mean I'm just uh, I'm just taking so to speak the limit of of B to zero and I'm extending this in a, in, a, in an asymptotic expansion if you want. So well, yes, yes, I see this mathematically. That's clear. But but uh, uh, for instance, in atomic physics, uh, the uh, the unit of B in atomic units is really huge. Uh, so uh, so that's. Uh, but uh, whereas if you are in a semiconductor, there are effective parameters, uh, and so the, uh, the magnetic unit is much much smaller. But uh, mm. okay, anyway. So you are. Uh, I mean, the point, this, is, uh, the point is, in, in some sense, that that this that this uh, magnetic field is really is really large in the sense that in uh, on the on the on the BC on the Ginzburg-Landau functional, you really mm -hmm. see this. I mean, you really have this this so to say magnetic so field which stays open in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. So the smallness of the of the magnetic field only refers to the fact that I'm working in a certain scaling here. Yeah. Um, I don't okay. know if this answers the question, but uh, okay, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay, so there is time for uh, other questions, if you wish. Uh, so apparently. No more questions. So maybe I have a question, Marcel. So it seems that you are studying the uh, dependence of the critical temperature on the magnetic field. And the, in the last slide, you show us. Uh, yes. Us, uh, slide. So, so it's like there are two possible values, two curves. Yes. So, so you do not uh, expect that uh, they coincide uh, all the time. Well, at least we have no idea. Let's say it like that. Huh? Yeah. Um, so this, what what goes on here, is is certainly something that is not determined by Ginzburg-Landau theory. Mm -hmm. um, so it could very well be that you are here uh, as you increase the temperature, you are alternatingly superconducting and normal, if you want. Yeah. Um, but but we cannot see this within this uh, within this uh, scaling regime here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and actually, we have no idea how to access that. <laughs> so it reminds me with uh, the critical field uh, problem. There is the critical magnetic field. So also there are several critical fields, and they coincide in a certain uh, regime, but not every everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's another context. It's about the ginzburg landau model. So, so it reminds me with that. So apparently, no more questions. So thank you again, Marcel, for the nice talk. Uh, we have uh, three minutes before the next talk. So next speaker is uh, Nails Benedictor. So, so is he... hi, hello, hello, hello. So we can share screen, please. Okay, it said work. Okay. That's clear, that's clear. So maybe we wait uh, a little bit. We have two minutes uh, before we start. Okay, so uh, maybe we can start uh, now. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Niels uh, Benedictor from uh, Università degli Studi de Milano, from Milano. Uh, he will talk about describing quantum correlations in the Fermi liquid bosonization. So by bosonization, okay, so, so please, Niels. <laughs> 
Right, okay. Shall we start already or do I wait 20 seconds more? I think it's fine to start, I think. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah thanks. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, right, so in the next 15 minutes, I want to summarize what I've been doing the last three or four years, which is uh, developing a technique, namely bosonization, to describe quantum correlations in certain um, fermionic many body systems, interacting fermionic many body systems. And this is joint work published in a number of papers together with Fantanam, Marcello Porta, Benjamin Schlein, and Robert Seiringer. So, I mean, of course, I assume everyone's very well acquainted with the Schrödinger equation here, but I want to talk a little bit about this particular scaling regime we consider, which we call the mean field scaling regime. So, okay, we're interested in a quantum system of n fermionic particles. And for simplicity, we take them to be spinless and we put everything on a fixed size three dimensional torus. So the Hamiltonian is the one written up here in blue. You have a as usual, a Laplacian for the kinetic energy, you have a coupling constant lambda, and you have a pair interaction where the V is some um, potential function. Now, okay, since we're interested in fermions, this acts on an L2 space of anti-symmetric wave functions of 3N variables. And by anti-symmetric, I mean, I mean the usual thing, right? If you permute the coordinates of the N particles, you pick up a sign of the permutation. Now, the main quantities we're interested in are the ground state energy, which is the infimum of the excitation spectrum, right? The infimum of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, which you can also characterize variationally by this expectation value here. And the other quantity we're interested in, or the other, other property we're interested in is the time evolution, according to the time-dependent Schrödinger equation, which is written down here. I mean, or equivalently, the solution would be given by the by the exponential e to the i h and t applied to the initial data upside naught. Now, typically, the number of particles is huge. In condensed matter systems, we have maybe 10 to the 20 particles or so, electrons in the metal, for example. So inevitably, we need some approximation methods to be able to, to derive any of the physical properties of the system from this Hamilton. And with approximation methods, general rule is no approximation fits in all cases. Every approximation should be adapted to the physical regime we're considering. And as mathematicians, we consider somewhat idealized physical regimes, which we model by scaling limits. So, the simplest possibility, so possibility of a scaling limit we could consider is the a gas of particles at high density with weak interaction. Um, and that's the simplest because then we expect some sort of mean field behavior, which means if we pick out a single particle, we can think of that particle as moving through a continuous cloud generated by all the other particles. That would be the, the mean field. Now, Let's be a little bit more precise about that. So what do I mean by high density? Well, that's very simple. We are on fixed size torus. So as we take n particle number two plus infinity, obviously we get a high density. Now, more interestingly, how weak is a weak interact? And that you can see by considering a simple example, namely you could say, let's take a look at a Slater determinant, which is given, um, in terms of plane waves, right? So the momenta k will be in set to the three since we're on a torus and a discrete set of momenta. And okay, so let's take this later determinant of plane waves and try to minimize the expectation value of the non interacting system, just the kinetic energy. So what's that? Well, it's just to sum all the squares of the momenta. Which momenta should be picked there? Well, we want to minimize this thing, right? So we just want to place, we want to pack all particles, all momenta as close as possible to the origin. While at the same time, 
no k can be occupied more than once because of the Pauli principle, because of the anti-symmetry of the weight function. That means we're filling up a ball. Um, that's the non-interacting Fermi ball, call it BF. And in order to have n particles in this Fermi ball, we need to have it radius of order n to the one third. Now, the result of that is if I look at the uh, expectation value of the kinetic energy, I have n terms. Typically, the order is n to the two third for a term. So it will be in total n to the five third compared to the interaction, which is lambda times a double sum, so lambda n squared, which means. I want to consider a non-trivial case of weak interaction, which means I want to choose lambda as n to the minus one third, so that I exactly balance kinetic energy and interaction energy. That's what I mean by mean field scaling vision. Now, there's a little further twist to the story, which is observe that the velocity, which is proportional to momentum, which is typically order n to the one third, as I just argued. So it's only natural to consider evolution up to times of order n to the minus one third. In order to realize this order n to the minus one third times, we say introduce a semi classical time t tau, tau of order one, and set t as n to the minus one third tau. Place that in the time dependent Schrödinger equation, and you'll get an n to the one third in front of the um, time derivative. Now let's do a little further trick, introduce what we call an effective Planck constant h bar as n to the minus one third, multiply the whole equation by h bar squared, and you'll get the Schrödinger equation in the form written down here in the box. So that's a nice form now. I mean, of course, mathematically, it's a triviality multiply by h bar squared or don't. But we like this form since we have this h bar, which really has not a function of a Planck constant. So h bar n to the minus one third to zero is a semi-classical scaling coupled with this mean field scaling given by the one over n here. Um, and OK, so that's the equation we want to consider. And now we ask the questions I already introduced. What is the ground state energy? What are the dynamics, the time evolution, and maybe even the excitation spectrum? So I will quickly try to tell you what bosonization has to tell about that and really what bosonization is in the first place. So I have to apologize to, well, I. I well, I will use uh, Fox space notation in momentum space, so I don't have time to explain this Hamiltonian, but you have to trust me that this is the same Hamiltonian as the one I started from. And now I want to employ what is called a particle hole transformation. Particle hole transformation basically considers simply to counting everything instead of relative to the vacuum, relative to the non intacting Fermi ball. And that's obtained by this tr unitary transformation R which takes a creation operator of momentum k into a creation operator if I'm outside the Fermi ball, takes it on an annihilation operator if I'm inside the Fermi ball. So creating an excitation inside the Fermi ball really makes, means making a hole in the Fermi ball, removing a particle that is, has been occupied before. Now, okay, transform. Uh, Hn expanded as far as possible, normal ordered. And you notice this nice thing that you're, by doing so, you separate the mean field energy, which is the Hartree Fock energy for fermions. So you'll find this Hartree Fock energy according to the plane wave Fermi ball, and then you get the transformed term. So what you observe here, for example, is that a, a particle P outside the Fermi ball counts still with kinetic energy P squared, as it should be, while a hole, making a hole inside the Fermi ball counts with negative kinetic energy minus h squared. And okay, then you have the transformation of the interaction, which is still going to be quartic in A Stein A operators. Now, the goal we have is to obtain a quadratic approximation to this excitation Hamiltonian given by the h kinetic together with the q. Um, why a quadratic approximation? Well, that's because quadratic Hamiltonians can be diagonalized by a Bogolyubov transformation. So 
once we have a quadratic approximation, we are we have almost solved the problem. So how do we get this quadratic approximation? Um, that is where bosonization comes in. So basically, it's first of all a simple observation that if you introduce these operators B star K, which are which combine the creation of a particle outside the Fermi ball, a hole inside the Fermi ball with relative momentum K, then the transformed interaction has this simple form written here. It's quadratic in terms of these uh, collective pair operators up to some small error terms. So we're already very close to the goal. And why is that bosonization? Well, that's because you notice that these B operators have approximately bosonic commutators. Namely, B star with B star commutes. Okay, that's not surprising. Fermionic operators anti commute, pairs of fermions commute. What is not quite so trivial is that a B with a B star is up to normalization, a delta, up to normalization, and a small error term. And that's really what you would have to have for bosons. So, this is what we call bosonization. Um, the non trivial question is what do you do with kinetic energy? And there you have to go a bit deeper and use this procedure that you cut up the entire surface of the Fermi ball in regions, which are these rectangles I've sketched here. Um, I put M of these patches on the Fermi surface and I localize the B star operators. So in, in renormalization group, a similar procedure is sometimes called the, the sectorization of the Fermi surface. So I'm local, I just have the same operator as before, but I'm localizing it into a region on the Fermi surface. And okay, I'm normalizing. The advantage is that now I can locally linearize the kinetic energy in a batch. I will find that a B star operator commuted with a uh, kinetic energy gives me, well, approximately an operator valued eigen, 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 eigenvalue equation. And if you see something like this, you maybe remember what Lieb and Mattis did in 65 for the one de Lattinger model. They simply said, okay, if I see this, I should replace H kinetic by a quadratic Hamiltonian, which produces the same commutator. And that's what we do. We replace H kinetic by this P star B uh, quadratic Hamiltonian, and that approximates our kinetic energy. Now, um, okay, observe that you get this factor K times omega alpha here. Now, of course, in the, in the interaction, I should do the same thing. I should take the B star operators and decompose them according to this decomposition of the Fermi surface. I should compute the normalization factors on the Fermi surface. And this is quite nice. Actually, you find what are they? Well, they are basically the number of particle hole pairs in a, a patch. Um, and you find that to be given by that the total surface area, which is order n to the two third, divided by the number of patches times this geometric factor, which comes from projection mm -hmm. argument. And it, this, this geometric factor is exactly this uh, u alpha squared that we had here from the kinetic energy. That's quite important because it tells us sort of that, okay, the Hamiltonian doesn't really have a gap, but the gap of the Hamiltonian closes at the same rate as the, as the energy of a potential B style for K excitation closes, vanishes. Okay, so now you plug all this into the Hamiltonian and you get an effective Hamiltonian, which is written down here. Now that might look a little long and scary, but you should see it's all quadratic in B operators. It's a typical Bogoliobov type Hamiltonian, which can really be diagonalized by a Bogoliobov transformation. And if you do that, you find, for example, the spectrum, which is quite interesting because you see if it doesn't have an interaction, spectrum looks like, like this. Where you should really think of this as a continuum, which is just discretized by, I think I chose m equal to 20 here. If you switch on the short range interaction, the top mode is a little bit moved, 
you switch on a stronger interaction, a Coulomb interaction, you, it separates really far off with a gap, and then it's called a, a plasmon excitation. And the other interesting thing is that the bulk down here is really only weakly renormalized. Um, and that's due to a sort of uh, eigenvalue interlacing argument. So maybe this could in the future be a, a non perturbative approach to, to Fermi liquid theory. Now, this was a lot of ideas. I just want to show you one rigorous result to conclude. So one, one rigorous result we have is the ground state energy, which we can get rigorously by this pr procedure, at least if the interaction is not too strong. And we find that the ground state energy is given by hartree fock theory, plus a new term that comes now from the bosonization, which is this big formula written down here. Now, that maybe looks a little bit like a big long formula here, but in reality, it's really just a continuum approximation to the infimum of the spectrum of the effective Hamiltonian. So sort of the hartree fox theory is the leading order and then bosonization is the next order. And okay, that's one thing we can do rigorously. Um, another thing we can do rigorously is the dynamics, assuming bosonic initial data. Now, I'll try to summarize that in 30 seconds. Um, what we do here is we consider initial data that is constructed by um, creating bosons on top of the Fermi ball. And then we can prove that these actually evolve um, under the effective Hamiltonian. So they evolve as non interacting bosons with this exactly this quadratic Hamiltonian here. And rigorously, what we prove is that this constitutes a, an approximation in Fox space norm for the, for the Schrodinger evolution of this initial data RT psi, where T is the Bogoliobov transformation that diagonalizes the effective Hamiltonian. So, um, okay, what's non trivial here is that this is a Fox space approximation. Indeed, it's a, some very older results of, that we have is that. If you look only at the one particle reduced density matrix, you can do with Hartree Fox theory. But for getting a Fox space norm approximation, you really need this uh, bosonization here. So I'm um, sorry for running a minute over time. I'll include here. Thank you very much, uh, Niles. So uh, we have uh, time for one or two questions. Uh, is... Hi Nils, it's Nicola from uh, from Lyon. Hi. Uh, for the last result, I assume it's uh, out of the question to start from non-equilibrium artery fox trial state. I mean non-non-equilibrium artery fox state plus bosonic excitations, and get the evolution of the artery fox plus the excitations. Yeah, at the moment that's. I mean, it's an interesting question, and I've heard it before, and I've thought about it. But at the moment, we can't say anything rigorous. But I, yeah, it's an obvious uh, conjecture what one would like to try to do next. But but would you expect it is actually true? Because it seems that bosonization is really very tied to uh, the particular artery fox state. I mean, the, 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 this this plane wave state. Yeah. yeah how yeah, how do you even formulate it uh, for general artery fox? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly the main problem why for general Hartree Fox state, I don't know how to formulate it, but you could, I mean, you could look at Hartree Fox states that are constructed by, by taking plane waves, you know, out of the Fermi ball, for example. Ah, yeah. Which yeah. would be non-equilibrium states, but. Um, yeah, so. Right, I mean, in general, I don't know. I can deform the Fermi ball maybe and uh, have a new surface and do the same game around this surface. Would that make right, sense? I could think of squeezing the Fermi ball in one direction or some of, something of that sort that should at least be possible to formulate. And if one can prove it, I don't know. OK, OK, thanks. Thanks, Nicola. So are there other questions? So probably from uh, the chat.
Like I have some question by chat, but I am unable to read it. So maybe I will unmute the speaker, the participant. Is it from Sahak Bozoyan? So I will unmute him. Uh, hello, uh, I would like to thank uh, thank you all for this uh, nice presentation. So I just wanted to know if uh, you're going to share with us uh, the PowerPoint. And also, concerning the hearty folk, uh, concerning uh, the Hamiltonian, would you get the same results using the Oppenheimer uh, Oppenheimer techniques or Oppenheimer Hamiltonians. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure you're referring to you're referring to a formulation of the Hartree Fock method due to Oppenheimer. I would suppose yes, but okay. But, but I'm, I'm not yeah. sure. I mean, it's a different thing than, for example, the born Oppenheimer method. Um, uh, okay, so I thank you again, uh, Nails, for uh, the talk. And uh, because time is up, we will go to the next uh, talk by Marco Olifiri. So can you share screen? Uh, sure. Uh, okay. You should see it. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing it uh, very well. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I am pleased to introduce now uh, Marco Olivieri from uh, the uh, KIT. Yeah. Uh, talk about uh, isometrization of uh, pseudo relativistic uh, molecules. So, Marco. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, I'm glad to be here uh, to present the results of my research. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Yannis Anapolitanos uh, and Sylvain Salsier and uh, it's uh, in the elf of uh, the CRC uh, 1173 wave phenomena. Okay, here there's uh, a brief sketch of the talk. Uh, at first, I will introduce, uh, uh, from a physical perspective, uh, the phenomenon of uh, isomerization. And I will show how um, to find the most convenient activation energy for uh, uh, isomerization phenomenon, isomeriz isomerization reaction. It is equivalent to solve a mountain pass problem. Then I will share with you uh, some uh, previous results and uh, compare with mine and uh, of the other guys, uh, of my collaborators. And uh, I will uh, reach uh, the case of uh, two molecules um, and um, present the main result. Uh, and if time allows, I don't think so, but uh, let's see, maybe you are curious uh, in the question, give a sketch of the two. So let's begin. Uh, with the uh, physical description of the uh, physical chemical uh, description of the isomerization. Well, isomerization reactions uh, are um, reactions where uh, the reagents share the same chemical formula uh, as the products. Here, there's a really paradigmatic example, HCN that transforms into CNH. And uh, as you can see, <coughs> the chemical formula is the same, but uh, what uh, what does change is uh, the chemical structure, so the spatial configuration of the atoms uh, forming uh, the molecule. Uh, here, as you can see, the hydrogen share uh, a, a simple bound with the carbon, and then uh, after the transformation, it shares uh, one electron with uh, uh, the uh, nitrogen. Uh, well, here, uh, just as comparison, uh, this is uh, uh, an example of a not uh, of something that it's not a isomerization uh, uh, reaction because as you can see the molecules uh, change their nature 
um, and not only the, the chemical structure. Okay, so I'll focus on uh, the reaction for two molecules and uh, Mm, from, um, well, quantum chemistry usually is uh, really, mm, really interested in finding activation energy, uh, that is the energy needed for the reaction to take place. And uh, uh, the parameters that vary during this reaction are the distance between the molecules, uh, the rotation of the first molecule, and the rotation of the second molecule. Here I... Um, uh, I put here this picture uh, to represent it in a usual way. Uh, as you can see, uh, an atom is fixed to be in uh, the zero in the space. Then uh, there's a translation L and there's the other atom, uh, another atom of the second molecule. And uh, we can um, uh, rotate the two molecules uh, with respect to this axis. Well, here uh, uh, you can imagine there's some um, since these are the only parameters that vary during this reaction, uh, I'm doing uh, a sort of assumption on uh, a fixed uh, internal geometry for the molecules. So uh, we are doing this assumption. Uh, and let's suppose that the reaction takes place in a certain interval of time between zero and uh, capital T. Uh, this space uh, is the space of the possible path of um, uh, along with uh, the reaction takes place. Uh, they are continuous paths uh, uh, from the time space to uh, the space of, uh, um, there's a triple of lengths, uh, the distance between the molecules, the rotation of the uh, first molecule and the rotation of the second molecule, such that the initial and final configurations are stable. Uh, and we can define this, uh, um, this function, that is the energy that varies along the reaction. Well, here, as you can see, I took uh, as an example, uh, uh, three possible reaction between uh, the, uh, the initial and final state. So here at first, there's a repentine increasing of the energy, but then uh, there's somehow a spontaneous reaction. Uh, the second red path uh, is um, different, it's uh, more or less the opposite. There's a slowly increasing energy and then uh, a really fast uh, decreasing uh, to the end point and uh, the black path is uh, a situation in between. Well, the activation energies here are the maximum of uh, um, the energies uh, along these paths. So let's, uh, let's imagine to uh, consider all the possible paths that um, uh, along with the reaction can take place. And for each one of these paths, consider the maximum, the maxima. Uh, so if we plot uh, this, uh, this graphic, uh, we obtain uh, somehow a similar uh, um, graphic that is no more time dependent. Here I try to uh, make it uh, more shading. Um, but this is now uh, a graphic that is uh, path dependent. So we are considering every point here, it's a maximum, it's the activation energy for a certain path of uh, a reaction. And if we consider this point, this dot, uh, as the minimal activation energy, uh, this is what, uh, um, what we are really interested in because it's the minimal activation energy that we have to furnish to uh, such that uh, the configuration of the molecules uh, attain and um, yeah, it's the most convenient uh, configuration if we understand which path is this, such that the reaction can, can take place. But there's to say that find precisely this path is uh, a huge task. So at least uh, we, can, uh, we can say that there's a minimizing sequence of paths such that uh, this, uh, uh, this point that is called the mountain pass, because as you can see, it somehow resembles a mountain pass, it's reached. So let's call C, the mountain pass that is the minimal activation energy along every possible path of reaction. And our claim is that for two neutral heavy molecules, so by heavy molecules, I mean molecules for which the pseudo-relativistic effects are quite relevant in, uh, in the, their description, uh, in their dynamical risk description. 
then there exists a minimum in sequence of paths uh, of these triples uh, in the admissible uh, paths such that the mountain pass is reached. But an important thing is that uh, we have compactness of uh, the paths. That is, uh, that the molecules uh, don't split up uh, and go to infinity. Um, uh, so actually, uh, preventing the reaction to take place, uh, if you want. Uh, or, I mean, uh, the isomerization, uh, uh, there's, uh, there are some also a, a experimental, um, experimental evidences uh, that uh, this uh, shouldn't happen for normal isomerization reaction. So this is important. This is our goal to prove. And we want to prevent uh, this situation where the molecules go far, far, far uh, one from each other. So. Uh, this, uh, um, this result uh, is uh, the, um, well, uh, there are some uh, previous results that led to uh, this one uh, following uh, the most important uh, for the rigorous point of view. Uh, there's one from Mathieu Lewin uh, where he studied uh, one molecule splitting in two subsystems. This is not an isomerization reaction, of course. And uh, he showed how uh, the non-compactness -compact uh, of uh, the reaction uh, is strictly connected to the splitting, but if the splitting is into two charged or polarized molecules, then uh, we reobtain again compactness because somehow there's, uh, there are more attractive forces uh, that prevent the splitting uh, to infinity. Then he studied the um, isomerization and proved uh, the compactness for the case of one molecule and one free atom. Uh, for example, uh, it's HCN and CNH, the paradigmatic example at the beginning I showed you. Uh, then Napolitano Saint Lewin proved the compactness for two light molecules, uh, where uh, the approximation of uh, the non relativistic Laplacian is uh, good. And then there's this interesting paper from Barbaro Harty, Gundertmark, uh, and uh, Bugalter uh, that also we took. Um, uh, we extended some of these uh, results because they proved uh, a van der Waals expansion for atoms uh, in a pseudo relativistic molecule that uh, we extended to multiple molecules, uh, um, yeah, to mo multiple molecules, uh, and we are going to use it. So now let's focus more in detail and uh, uh, present the main result about the isomerization for two heavy molecules and show how uh, uh, the mountain pass can be reached. Um, by compact paths. So we have uh, uh, two molecules, uh, M1 and M2 nuclei in positions uh, uh, described by the vectors uh, Y1 and Y2, and relative charges uh, um, for the nuclei, uh, zeta1, zeta m1, and zeta m1 plus 1, and zeta m respectively. Uh, we are considering neutral molecules, so uh, N1 and N2, the uh, number of electrons for, uh, every mo for each molecule, uh, sum, uh, sum up to uh, the um, positive charges in the nuclei. And as, if, as I said, uh, we are assuming a fixed internal geometry along the reaction. So uh, again, uh, I, I underline the fact that um, the only parameters are the distance between the molecules and these two um, rotations that vary. So here there's the um, usual uh, uh, pseudo relativistic uh, uh, Hamiltonians uh, um, with Coulomb interaction. Here I have the free uh, Hamiltonian for the first molecule. Here, as you can see, uh, we have a pseudo, pseudo relativistic Laplacian that is uh, a non local operator and that. Uh, complicates a lot uh, the description, uh, the analysis, I mean. Uh, um, and here, the uh, internal Coulomb interaction, uh, um, electron-electron, the repulsion, and uh, electron uh, nuclei, uh, nucleus. The same for the free, uh, let's, let's call it free uh, Hamiltonian for the second molecule. And this is the uh, intermolecular Coulomb interaction. Well, let's call. Uh, Hn, the sum of these, two, uh, of, of these three operators, that is the full uh, Hamiltonian, and uh, call uh, En the um, uh, total uh, ground state energy for uh, the whole system, E1 the free energy for the first molecule, and E2 
the free energy for uh, the second molecule. Well, we can prove uh, a Van der Waals expansion for, um, for this uh, system of two molecules where the, uh, this is a upper bound obtained by finding a suitable uh, um, trial function. Uh, and uh, this full uh, ground state energy is less or equal than uh, the sum of the two free energies plus these uh, multipolar expansions uh, that are uh, distance dependent. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the details uh, of defining uh, these coefficients. Let's simply say that these coefficients are the, describe the um, multipolar interaction uh, coming from uh, the formation of uh, um, Permanent, permanent multiples. And this is uh, from, uh, um, the, it's the Van der Waals correlation function that comes from instantaneous dipoles uh, or uh, multiples. Okay, but this is an upper bound. If we uh, do a further uh, assumption, uh, we obtain uh, uh, also a, a lower bound by a feshbach map argument. Well, this, um, this is quite technical, uh, this assumption, but uh, uh, it's an uh, irreducibility condition for the um, free um, ground state spaces. Uh, we are assuming uh, that the uh, ground state spaces uh, um, are generated by only one vector up to um, permutation of the variables, of the position variables. Um, and this expansion holds as well for um, if we take in consideration fermions. So um, uh, here we, we consider um, Hamiltonians with the projection on uh, uh, the anti-symmetric uh, uh, subspaces. Well, but having this expansion, we are able to finally prove uh, uh, the mean result. Well, uh, let's denote by n naught and m naught the leading term for these expansions, that is the first term here, that the biggest term that uh, doesn't vanish. Uh, and if uh, the sum n naught uh, plus m naught is bigger, st strictly bigger than five, or it's uh, strictly low, lower than five, but uh, uh, that's the irreducibility condition. Unfortunately, with our techniques, are, we are not able to treat the five case because in this case, uh, uh, these terms, uh, uh, there's a fight between this and this, uh, and then we don't know if during along the reaction, uh, there's, there could be the formation of some uh, uh, dipoles that repel uh, one with each other, and so push away the uh, molecules. But in these cases, uh, we are able to prove that there exists a minimizing sequence of compact paths of reaction such that the mountain pass is reached and uh, uh, such that the uh, molecules are not uh, thrown away to infinity. Well, this completes the, um, uh, the result. Uh, here, that's a sketch of the proof, but uh, maybe if you are curious uh, otherwise, for now, I thank you for uh, the attention. Well, thank you very much, Marco. So we have room for questions. I have a question. Yes, um, if, if I saw correctly, you used pseudo relativistic kinetic energy. Why this choice? Uh, well, uh, this choice, uh, it's simply because that, uh, that case uh, was still not, uh, not treated um, because, uh, oh, where is it? Okay, because uh, as you can see, the case for light molecules uh, was treated by Anapolitanos and uh, Lewin. Uh, but um, for heavy molecules, for example, uh, well, there, there are some cases of uh, isomerization that I'm aware of uh, are uh, conglomerates of gold where there are some impurities that can change uh, the, um, the spatial configuration or for example, some organic molecules where there are some isomerization reactions. And in that case, the, um, the pseudo-relativistic uh, description is more suitable uh, and uh, this wasn't covered by this, um, this paper. And furthermore, uh, uh, it was also interesting from a mathematical point of view because uh, um, uh, here uh, the description is portrayed by uh, using the Laplacian. 
uh, while instead here uh, this was a non-local operator, so we had to develop some uh, uh, inequalities and some controls uh, to obtain a Van der Waals expansion that uh, uh, held uh, the same. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So other questions? So probably no more questions. 